Welcome to our basics lecture on Ebola. We're going to discuss some basic virus anatomy, some Ebola anatomy and effects, and then look at the new drug ZMAP and how it's developed. A virus is defined as a very small infectious particle consisting of nucleic acid enclosed in a protein coat. As you can see, viruses vary a lot in shape and size but they all have either DNA or RNA, and they have a protein coat, which is called a capsid, and is made up of repeating proteins called capsomeres. Many viruses, in addition, are surrounded by a membrane layer, shown here, with glycoproteins embedded in it. The Ebola virus is part of the group of viruses called filoviridae. It contains a viral envelope, and its nucleic acid is a negative single-strand RNA, which is wrapped inside its caspid, as shown here. There are an array of glycoproteins along the surface of the membrane, and we'll be talking about those quite a bit. When a person is infected with Ebola, the virus binds to the host cell membrane via its glycoproteins. They bind to a receptor on the edge of the cell that was intended for another purpose. When the cell binds to the virus, it engulfs the virus via endocytosis, shown here. And then in order to destroy the virus, the cell engulfs it with a lysosome, which we've seen before, which has a low pH and destructive enzymes. Unfortunately, the virus has evolved so that the low pH in a lysosome is actually a trigger. It causes the virus to release the capsid and its RNA into the cytoplasm of the cell. The single-strand RNA is called a negative strand, meaning it's the wrong orientation to work as an mRNA molecule. The virus, however, uses an included RNA polymerase to bind to this negative strand mRNA and make a positive mRNA copy that can be used to translate into proteins. So we have the negative strand originally from the virus here. The RNA polymerase makes copies, which can be then used for transcription into usable mRNA, uh, and then can make more copies of the negative original strand of RNA that will end up to make new virus. The mRNA that's now the correct positive direction, 5' prime to 3' prime, goes a couple different places depending on the protein that's going to be made. If it's an mRNA that's associated with the glycoproteins of the membrane on the virus envelope, then it's picked up and the ribosomes go to the rough ER, the proteins are transported to the Golgi, and then transported to the plasma membrane. If it's an mRNA associated with the capsid proteins, then ribosomes that are free in the cytoplasm bind and make these proteins, and they also end up near the plasma membrane but in the cytoplasm. We now have all the ingredients necessary to make a new virus the capsid protein, the RNA, and the membrane, and the membrane glycoproteins. The host cell is forced to make new viruses after manufacturing all the parts of the virus and buds off many thousands of new virus particles from itself before it dies and lyses or breaks open. Right. So Ebola infections cause the death of the host cells. Uh, the resulting hemorrhagic fever is a complicated bit of immune response in cell and body physiology, but let's simplify it a little bit to show why Ebola infections cause death. An infection of the virus usually targets liver cells and blood cells. Blood cells are important for the immune response, and this infection prevents an effective immune response. Particularly, the dendritic cells are unable to make antibodies to the Ebola virus. These cells, now that they've been infected, produce these anti-inflammatory molecules that cause a lot of reactions in the body at a systemic or body-wide level. The two main ones are that they cause blood vessels to actually leak fluid out instead of keeping fluid in. So there's a lot of blood loss from the blood. And there's also this uh, ironic increased clotting of the blood. The clotting factors cause there to be blood clots within capillaries. So both of these factors, the reduced blood pressure and the reduced uh, clotting, prevent blood flow from reaching organs effectively, and the organs starve from lack of oxygen and break down, and the person dies 
from what's called shock or organ failure because of low blood. Now, in a normal immune response, the body reacts to the virus by making antibodies that bind to the glycoproteins on the surface of the virus. And this is useful because first, antibodies can cause viruses to stick together or agglutinate, which prevents them from infecting cells. The presence of antibodies can also block the virus from binding to the receptors on the surface because they're all full up of antibodies, so the cell is unable to engulf the viruses and the cells do not become infected. But as we said before, this antibody response is actually deadened by the virus itself and very few antibodies are normally made. The current only known treatment for Ebola consists of making antibodies that can be given by injection even though the body cannot provide its own. Uh, it's extremely new. It's never been tested in humans, and it's extremely complicated to make. We're going to talk a little bit about the steps of the process because the biology is interested, interesting, and also to give you a sense for what's involved in treating Ebola. The first step is to make the instructions for an antibody. Uh, antibodies vary uh, widely based on what they are attached to. Uh, and we can't give people Ebola to have them make antibodies. So instead, we give a broken down piece of Ebola to a mouse, just the glycoproteins. And when you give the glycoproteins to the mouse, the mouse makes antibodies to it. We then sacrifice the mouse, sorry, mouse, and take the spleen cells from the mouse that made these antibodies. They've now been sensitized to the Ebola glycoprotein, and they have the DNA instructions to make the antibody. Unfortunately, spleen cells don't live very well outside of mice. They tend to die uh, rather quickly. And so we mix the spleen cells with a group of cancer cells that live well in the lab. They're willing to reproduce continuously, almost forever. And so this mixture of myeloma cells and spleen cells creates what are called hybrid OMA cells that contain the uh, instructions from the spleen cell and the willingness to multiply repeatedly from the myeloma cells. All of these hybridoma cells are placed in little different dishes and allowed to make antibodies, and then they test the antibodies against Ebola until they find a cell that's making antibodies that bind well to the Ebola virus in its natural state. They take that cell and say that's the one that's got the good instructions for making an antibody against um, Ebola. So we have here a mouse set of antibodies. And in science, we use murine when we're talking about mouse. That means the same thing. So we have murine antibodies against Ebola, which is great, except that humans actually react badly if you inject mouse antibodies into them, because even though the mouse antibody binds to Ebola, humans are like, wait, this is a foreign thing also, and they attack the antibody and break it down very quickly. Humans are really only respond well to human antibodies, but we can't make human antibodies against Ebola without giving Ebola to a human. So we need to take the important parts of the mouse antibody and mix it with the acceptable structure of the human antibody so that the human immune system will accept these new antibodies in the drug. This process of adding little bits of the important active sites of the murine antibody to a human antibody is called humanizing the antibody and requires several steps. Um, we know the DNA associated with the human antibody. So we know the sequence of nucleotides bases that make a uh, amino acid sequence that's a protein antibody. We find out the sequence of DNA that's needed in several places in order to make a successful antibody against Ebola. We splice in the murine bits that make this uh, DNA that's human actually respond to Ebola. Right? And now we've created a humanized antibody instructions, right? This is DNA now, not the antibody. These are instructions for making an antibody that should be both acceptable in a human and bind to Ebola except that ZMAP has found that it's more successful if they can actually put in three antibodies into the drug instead of just one. So they have to do this whole splicing and sequencing two more times in order to create three instruction sets to make an antibody. Okay, so that's already been quite complicated and we're not there yet. The next step is to actually make a bunch of antibodies. Okay. And we need some sort of system where cells are dividing and healthy and willing to make a bunch of proteins that are essentially useless to themselves. 
And this is a complicated thing and difficult to maintain over a long time. The technique used by the company that's making ZMAP is to use the tobacco plant as the host plant to make the antibodies against Ebola. And here's the process for doing that. We've generated our DNA instructions for making the three antibodies. We're now going to take the DNA from a virus that's good at inflecting plants. And we've seen that viruses not only have um, just DNA, uh, but they have to have the DNA necessary to instruct the host cell on how to make more DNA and more proteins. So there's different instructions in here about how to do the transcription and the translation. They splice in the DNA, draw it here, for making the three antibodies. So now we have a very special virus DNA plasmid, that's what we call DNA that's shaped like a circle like this, that has the instructions for making the antibody. This still won't infect a plant, it's just a string of DNA. We also have a bacteria that's normally found in the soil and naturally infects plants. It's called agrobacterium. Because it's good at infecting plants and giving plants its DNA, we're going to use it. Bacteria in general are good at picking up DNA from the environment, so we put these in a solution together, and that causes the bacteria, in many cases, to pick up our plasmid that we've created that has the antibodies. So now we have a bacterium that has the antibody DNA, as well as its own DNA shown here. We're going to take this bacterium and go to a tobacco plant. In a young tobacco plant, they take a syringe full of the bacterium in solution, and they actually take off the needle and just smoosh the fluid into the leaf of the tobacco plant. That causes the bacterium to actually shove um, its materials from the bacteria. It infects the plant cell. So that we end up with our plasmid, with instructions for the antibodies inside the plant cell. Okay. The bacteria does its work. There's instructions for making antibodies here. The plant cell is going to start making antibodies for Ebola, which it's never seen, and is not in fact even susceptible to. And it's going to start sending those antibodies out into the fluid of the tobacco plant. The tobacco plants have to be grown in a very secure and climate controlled environment with a certain amount of nutrients and water in order to grow effectively. About two to three months, they can harvest the tobacco plants, grind up the plants, and separate out the protein fractions, find the protein fractions that include the antibodies, isolate those antibodies and create a serum. And that serum is the drug ZMAP that can then be kept under cold storage under very secure and sterile uh, conditions and be given to somebody who has been infected with Ebola virus. And the antibody will attack the virus and help the person mount an immune response to overcome it. But you can see that this is why there wasn't a lot of this uh, experimental drug just sitting around on a shelf and why even if it does work, it's very difficult to ask the company, we'll just make some more, please. We need some more of this ZMAP because it's a massive undertaking in order to grow all of the materials needed in order to uh, make more antibodies. All right, that's all the content we have. Let me summarize the things that we've talked about. General virus anatomy, the specifics of Ebola, what happens in an Ebola infection in the host cell and also in the body, why an antibody treatment would be helpful, and why it's so hard to make ZMAP in order to mount an antibody treatment for this disease. This completes our basics video. Be able to do the following in order to do well on the quiz. Thank you so much for watching.